AITA, did I ruin family dinner by speaking up? I, 27 am, am the third of four siblings and have always felt like an afterthought. Lori 33, Chuck, 29 am, and J, 25 of, have always gotten the first and best from my parents and each other. I get the leftovers if I'm lucky. I haven't gotten a birthday present from any of my siblings in about 10 years, but I still get asked to pitch in for group gifts for each of them every year. On Friday night, we were having a family dinner, and it honestly felt like every other sentence was a dig at me, or a less, than subtle brag by my siblings about something they had been given by my parents that I was denied. They talked about how nice almost all of our weddings were, but made sure to mention it was okay that my wife and I had a small low-key wedding. And it was okay, we loved it. But they brushed over that my parents paid for all of my siblings' weddings, but not mine. Because somehow they couldn't afford it, because they were saving up for Jade's wedding. They brought up how little student loans they have, because my parents helped them. All of them lived on campus at expensive four-year schools. I lived at home and went first to a very prestigious, very hard to get into watchmaking school. I got paid to attend this school, so I paid rent at home. My parents paid for my tools. And I appreciate the help. I really do. But they paid 120 to 150 each for my siblings, they gave me 7 for tools. But to them, it's equal. When I went back to school on my own, I didn't ask for money and wasn't offered it. When my brother went back to school, they covered everything without him even having to ask. There were many other small moments comments about cars and other lifestyle choices, but what made me snap was my brother and his wife mentioning their marriage being so great because they do things like spontaneous dates, like the one they had the prior Friday night. On Friday night, when my parents called my wife and me at the last minute to cancel plans, they had to eat dinner at our house because they had to watch Chuck's kids because of an emergency. Turns out that emergency was a dinner for Chuck and my SIL at Texas Roadhouse. I spent hours making my grandpa's ziti and meatballs with homemade marinara because it's my mom's favorite. I wanted to scream at them more than anything, but instead I got up and left without saying a word, and my wife followed me. When my mom called me later to ask why I'd left, I explained exactly why. I explained the favoritism, the unfairness, and the fact that it doesn't feel like they care about me. She didn't say much, and I wasn't really looking for an explanation or an apology at the moment, I just felt like it was self-evident, but if she really didn't see it, I'd spell it out. Evidently, at least parts of what I said have been shared with my siblings, because now Chuck and Lori are furious at me and saying I ruined dinner, and my mom is upset that I am hurt. They say I'm immature for keeping score. AITA? My first draft contained some of this info, but I had to edit a lot to get down to the character limit. Some of this has been shared in other comments, but I'm just consolidating in hopes this is seen and answers questions. 1. There is no reason to believe I am not my father's child. The list of genetic coincidences that would be necessary for that to be the case is long and not worth rehashing. He doesn't have any male relatives that could explain it either. He has one sibling, my aunt, and none of his cousins have ever been in his life or even remotely local. I look just like my paternal grandfather. I always have. He died when my father was young, but by all accounts, he was a good father and is remembered fondly. 2. My younger sister has been the beneficiary of many, if not most of the things my parents chose not to give to me, but she did not ask for any of that and has been one of the only people consistently trying to make it right. For goodness sake, she was trying to fix it when she was six. She has definitely not seen everything, but she has tried to correct what she has seen. She is perhaps guilty of assuming the best of people and not asking questions, but she isn't heartless, and getting angry at her isn't going to fix anything. We talked for a long time after I posted this. She had been told she was contributing a birthday gift for me every year since at least 2018. She gave money to my older sister to buy my wife and me tickets to my favorite soccer team, and then when my wife and I inevitably posted about going to games, she assumed one of the games we went to each year was the gift she had been contributing money towards. There is a lot of backstory there, but the gist of it is that Jade and I have always gotten along well and Jade does not participate in singling me out negatively. She and her husband spend time with my wife and I frequently, usually just the four of us. 3. My maternal grandfather favored me growing up, but it's not like I got extra gifts or anything. He and I have very similar personalities, which is evident from a young age. I am on the spectrum, and I feel very strongly that were he my age, he'd have been diagnosed as well. We both struggle mightily with a lot of sensory things, but loud crowds and being surrounded by a lot of disparate sources of noise, like, perhaps, his loud Italian family, overwhelms both of us, so both of us hide for at least some portion of all family gatherings. 
Over time we started hiding together by just leaving to play box or lock ourselves in the kitchen to cook. As an adult, he has made comments that indicate he sees that I'm not being given as much, and in the last two to three years, he has definitely given more items to me than anyone else, things he wants me specifically to have a slash when he passes and that he wants me to enjoy now. That was definitely a source of tension on Friday. He is quite wealthy, and my older siblings are accusing me of trying to enrich myself through inheritance. I have no clue what his plans are, and I have not, and will never ask. It's not my business, he has always had a pathological need to make things even. Everyone gets the same number of boxes at Christmas, with as near as possible, the exact amount of money spent on each recipient, so I do not expect him to behave differently with his estate. I honestly expect that anything that doesn't go to charitable causes will be divided evenly, but I really, really think it's all going to charity. But where my older siblings see the monetary value of his record collection and view it as a financial windfall. I just see a beautiful collection of music I get to keep listening to. I'd never sell that. They feel that I am hoarding the antique watches he gave me. The most valuable of which is a 60s Timex Marlin. But again, they just want me to sell them and divide the cash. First of all, they aren't valuable except in sentiment. Second of all, Pop Pop is very much still alive and only gave them to me because he knows I will repair the ones I like and wear them. Selling them would be extremely rude and entitled. They are angry that he gave me his first nice car, because it does not have a nominal value, even now, it is too old to be valuable as a reliable vehicle, and is not old, rare, or desirable enough to be a collector's item. But to me, it's a sentimental item. It was his Sunday car for years, and while I've had to put a lot of work into keeping it running well, it's an excellent cosmetic condition. My older siblings are contesting that I am actually the favorite, and the very measurable and extremely generous financial gifts given to them by my parents are somehow dwarfed by their IMO very inflated estimation of the financial value of the gifts my grandfather has given me recently. 4. My paternal grandmother has increasingly favored me as I've aged. Again, this is not financial, and to my knowledge, she isn't in a position to leave me an inheritance, not that I'd even ask that of her. There's an old clock of hers made by a local clockmaker and housed in a handmade cabinet that I used to spend hours looking at when I was really young. She put multiple labels inside as early as I was five or six, saying that it belonged to me. But I didn't ask for that. I appreciate it and will gladly accept it if she still feels that way when the time comes, but I don't spend the time I spend with her as some sort of plot to steal her clock. I just like hanging out with my Alma. She's a funny lady who likes walking with my wife, my dogs, and me. She stays with us in our house on holidays instead of in the guest house my parents had built for her. My siblings are under the impression that she has somehow supported me financially. Again, unless there is something I am not aware of, she is not in the position to do this. 5. My wife and I will meet with my parents sometime over the next week to talk. I do not know what to expect, but I will be taking the time to write stuff down in preparation. I don't even know what I want from it, but I will be bringing up family therapy. About a week after that post, my wife and I sat with my parents and cleared there. As several people suggested I wrote down my thoughts. I compiled, to the best of my knowledge, a listing and full accounting of the disparity between what my siblings were given over the years and what I was given. I did sit down and do the math, and it turns out that while I was at the Technicum, I paid my parents more in rent than they ever paid for my tools. But the final reckoning came to between tilde $370 and K on the high end, Jade, to tilde $190 and K on the low end, Chuck, for how much my parents directly gave to my siblings that they never gave me. Sitting down and seeing the full amount all spelled out like that is probably the angriest I got during this whole mess. My parents had been aware there were discrepancies. Still, they pushed back on the actual amounts until we sat down and reviewed each major gift slash incident case by case. By that point, my dad admitted my reckoning was likely conservative. That was more or less the end of any productive talk that night. My dad claimed they didn't think it had gotten that bad, but wouldn't give any details about how they could have possibly not noticed. In the interim, Chuck and Lori continued to escalate their anger and continued to call and text me, my parents, and my extended family. I have not spoken to either of them directly since and don't expect too soon. Roughly a week after that first sit-down, my mom and dad asked to meet again. Lots was said, but the gist is this, they felt I was doing well and didn't need their help. Basically, they thought I would be fine without them. They admitted they probably lived outside their means and gave more to my older siblings than they should have and could never have given me that much. They claimed the timing of my wedding lined up with probably the direst of their overspending slash lack of saving and that they did not have the funds to live up to their promise 
especially as they were paying for Jade's tuition, car and apartment at that time. They have offered money, they have offered to pay for vacations, a car and all kinds of stuff, but I think they don't really get it yet. My wife and I don't want their money, but we aren't sure yet what an ideal resolution to this looks like. At least they have admitted they were unfair and are open to working things out. My wife and I spent Easter with Jade, her husband and my grandparents, and my mom and dad came over in the evening. This seems to be more or less the new normal for now. AITA for telling my girlfriend she's overreacting after discovering her son in a private moment? I 48M have been dating my girlfriend Kelly, 50F, for almost two years now. We're currently on vacation with her son Ryan, 23M, and his girlfriend Emily, 23F, as well as my sister, brother-in-law niece and her boyfriend. This vacation was meant to be a relaxing break for all of us, a chance to unwind and enjoy each other's company. To give some context, I've known Ryan very well for nearly a decade. I was his coach in high school, and over the years we developed a strong bond. He's like a son to me. Ryan and Emily have been together since high school, and their relationship has always seemed solid and loving. I've always admired how they've managed to maintain their connection through the ups and downs of growing up. When we were planning this trip, Kelly insisted that Ryan and Emily couldn't share a room. I initially thought she was joking, as it seemed like an unusual request. However, she was serious about it. I know Ryan is sexually active and has been for a while. I agreed to her rule, so Ryan and my niece's boyfriend were set to share a room, while my niece and Emily were supposed to share another. It seemed like a fair compromise at the time. As the trip approached, we all had mixed feelings. Kelly's insistence on the room arrangement felt a bit extreme to me, but I didn't want to create conflict. The night before we left, I handed out the room keys and explained the arrangement. Everyone seemed okay with it, though there was a noticeable lack of enthusiasm from some. The girls even had a slumber party on one of the first nights, which seemed like a fun way to bond. Ryan figured that Kelly's insistence on separating him and Emily was a way to placate her insecurities. He seemed to understand that this was more about Kelly's comfort than about their relationship. I handed him his room keys and said, Give the second one to whoever, so he gave it to Emily. My niece also handed her spare key to her boyfriend, as we had anticipated. Things seemed to be going smoothly until one evening when Ryan left his wallet in our room. Instead of handing it to him at breakfast, knocking on his door, or sending a text, Kelly decided to use the key to enter his room. This was an unexpected decision that would have significant consequences. Kelly walked into the room and saw Ryan and Emily in a situation she didn't expect. To be fair, they weren't having sex. They were both naked from the waist down, but they were simply cuddling, with Ryan gently touching Emily's back. It was a tender, affectionate moment that was not intended to be seen by anyone else. Kelly was immediately distressed. She left the room in a state of panic and refused to come to breakfast. When I tried to comfort her, she was inconsolable. I told her that she should be grateful that she only saw them snuggling and not engaging in sexual activity. This comment meant to ease her anxiety only made her more upset. She accused me of not understanding her feelings and overreacting to the situation. Ryan is an adult who has been with the same woman for years, and I've never seen Emily do anything to warrant Kelly's strong dislike. Although Kelly has admitted that she doesn't like Emily, I've always seen Emily as a kind and caring person who genuinely loves Ryan. Emily's punky appearance contrasts with Ryan's more preppy style, but that hasn't affected how I view their relationship. Kelly's reaction escalated quickly. She called me names and accused me of siding with Emily over her. Her behavior was so out of character that I began to worry about her well-being. I wondered if she might have forgotten to take some of her mood-regulating medication, as her response seemed disproportionate to the situation. Currently, while Kelly sulks inside, the rest of us are trying to enjoy the beach. Ida, to answer some questions, Ryan and Emily have been living together for about five years, and Ryan covered their share of the trip expenses. When Kelly first mentioned that they shouldn't share a room, I thought she was joking and laughed it off. It wasn't until we checked in, and I was handing out the key cards, that she reminded me of her rule. Instead of arguing, I handed out the keys and went to relax on the beach. Kelly is in therapy and takes medication for mood regulation, though I'm unsure if she has it with her during the trip. This added layer of complexity has made the situation even more challenging. I'm trying to process everything while on vacation, 
and it's been difficult to keep up with all the comments. I appreciate the feedback, though I'm not able to respond to everyone. Update Thank you to everyone who commented. I've read every comment, even if I didn't reply. Your feedback has been helpful and sometimes entertaining. To clarify a few things, I'm aware that Kelly has mental health issues, but in the nearly two years we've been together, I hadn't noticed anything particularly troubling. Her relationship with Ryan has improved over time, and she's been attending therapy and taking medication for mood regulation. I've always been cautious about enabling behavior, including Kelly's. When she first mentioned separating Ryan and Emily, I genuinely thought she was joking. I didn't take it seriously. When she reminded me in the lobby, I thought it was an absurd request but decided not to argue. I handed out the keys and went to relax on the beach. I decided to speak to Ryan first, as I've known him the longest and figured he would be the most understanding. He was surprisingly calm about the situation and even apologized, which I assured him was unnecessary. Ryan mentioned that Kelly had previously struggled with issues of emotional incest, particularly when he was a teenager. This ongoing issue seemed to have resurfaced with this situation. Emily shared that Kelly had previously walked in on them having sex during their high school years, which had led to Ryan moving in with Emily's family. This history added another layer to Kelly's reaction. Kelly managed to secure an emergency therapy appointment, which significantly helped her calm down. During our conversation, she revealed that the incident triggered old traumas related to her experiences as a single mother and feelings of abandonment. Ryan's father left her shortly after Ryan was born, leaving her to raise him on her own. These unresolved issues likely played a significant role in her intense reaction. When I asked Kelly about her dislike for Emily, she initially said it was because Emily was opinionated and seemed to have Ryan under her control. I encouraged her to reframe her feelings more constructively. Kelly eventually admitted that she was upset because Ryan appeared so devoted to Emily. I reminded Kelly that she should be proud of raising a son who deeply loves and appreciates his partner. This conversation seemed to help improve her mood. Interestingly, Kelly's therapist suggested she consult her primary care doctor or obstetrics-slash-gynecology about menopause, which might explain her extreme reaction. Kelly confirmed that she had forgotten to bring some of her mood-regulating medication, and her sister was bringing it to her later in the trip. Finally, Ryan and Emily joined us for a heartfelt discussion. There were apologies, tears, and hugs as they expressed their feelings. They acknowledged that the main issue was Kelly's uninvited entry into their room. Kelly admitted that she had hoped to catch them off guard but couldn't justify her actions. Ryan set clear boundaries with Kelly, something I've seen him do before and respect him for. Kelly took responsibility and shared the details of her therapy session, which led to understanding and compassion from Ryan and Emily. Emily even suggested we have a drink together to help smooth things over. We all agreed that the situation was ridiculous and that we wanted to enjoy our vacation. Kelly eventually joined us, and we managed to relax and enjoy the rest of our time together. Our days were filled with drinks, beach outings, good food, and nats, and despite the rocky start, I couldn't have been happier with how things turned out. AITA for keeping my marriage a secret from my ex? My wife and I were near Seattle last weekend, visiting my family. We're both in our early 30s and have been happily married for four years together for six. It was a relaxing trip, and we decided to spend Saturday evening catching up with old friends at a bar in my hometown. After settling in and getting comfortable, I decided to head to the restroom. As I was making my way through the crowd, I felt a tap on my shoulder. To my astonishment, it was Jen, my ex. Jen and I had been in a relationship for four years during our early 20s. We ended things because she wanted to explore more of life, feeling as though she missed out since I was her first serious boyfriend. At the time, I was very happy with her, and I had a promising job in tech that was setting us up for a secure future. I was even a few months away from proposing. Her departure was a heavy blow, and it took me a considerable amount of time before I felt ready to date again. Although we remained friends for a year after the breakup, I eventually decided to cut off contact to help myself move on and we haven't spoken since. My wife is aware of this entire backstory. When Jen tapped me on the shoulder, I was genuinely surprised. We hugged and exchanged pleasantries. 
Jan was with a group of friends, many of whom I knew from years back. They all came over to say hello as well. We spent a few minutes catching up, mostly discussing what I had been up to since returning to my hometown and sharing updates about our lives. I started to feel that the conversation needed to end, so I abruptly mentioned that it was nice to see her again, but that I needed to return to my friends at the table. Jen agreed, and I quickly turned around. To my surprise, I found my wife standing right behind me. My friends had identified Jen from our table, and my wife had come over to join me. I told my wife it was quite the coincidence and took her hand as we headed back to our table. Once we were seated, my friends immediately began discussing Jen. My wife appeared visibly uncomfortable with the situation. Despite my attempts to change the subject, I learned that Jen had married someone a few years ago, but they had divorced last year. She had moved back to her hometown to stay with her parents while she figured out her next steps. My wife seemed very interested in Jen's life and asked a lot of questions, which made me uncomfortable as I was trying to avoid dwelling on the topic. On the drive home, my wife asked why I hadn't mentioned that I was married and introduced her to Jen. She felt that I should have made it clear that I was happily married. I explained that I was simply trying to end the conversation quickly because I had gone no contact with Jen long ago and preferred to keep it that way. My wife then asked how I felt seeing Jen again after so long. I told her I was surprised by the encounter, but honestly Jen felt like a stranger now. I admitted that I felt a bit sad about how things had turned out for her. My wife was upset because she felt I should have introduced her to Jen. She was also bothered by the length of Jen's hug and thought I should have clearly stated that I was married and had a wonderful wife. She felt slighted that I didn't include her in the conversation, especially since she had come over to stand next to me. From my perspective, I was just trying to wrap up the conversation and didn't see how introducing my wife would have helped. The situation escalated the next morning when Jen sent me a friend request on Instagram and also messaged me, saying it was nice to meet me. This seemed to trigger my wife and my mom, who had always disliked Jen, went on a rant about her. My wife took comfort in this, since she had never liked Jen from the start. My wife believes that my failure to make it clear to Jen that I was married led to Jen's follow-up message. I declined the Instagram request and did not respond to her message. However, a part of me feels that my wife might be right and I might have made a mistake. Am I the offer not telling Jen I was married and introducing her to my wife, who was right next to me? I simply wanted to exit the conversation and was rushing to get back to my table. Top Comment Plastic Concert I don't understand how you could catch up with Jen without mentioning your wife, even indirectly. As a married person, it's natural to refer to your spouse. For example, you could have used we instead of I when talking about your life. Also, it seems more natural to say, I need to get back to my wife, rather than, I need to get back to my friends. Your wife should be your priority. If you wanted to end the conversation, mentioning your wife would have been a built-in excuse. I find your behavior somewhat odd. Is it possible that, even subconsciously, you didn't want Jen to know you were married? Update post a few days ago, I posted about running into my ex, Jen, during a trip to my hometown. My wife saw me talking to her, and I, in a lapse of judgment, forgot to introduce Jen to her. This oversight upset my wife, who felt that I should have mentioned I was married. I appreciate everyone who commented and pointed out how poorly I handled the situation. We got back home yesterday. Even though my wife seemed to have moved past the incident, I felt it was important to apologize and clarify that I had no ill intentions. It was a deer-in-the-headlights moment for me, and I should have introduced her to Jen. That night, while my wife was scrolling through her phone in bed, I decided to bring up the issue. I apologized for the incident on Saturday, and acknowledged that I should have introduced her to Jen so she could see that I am happily married. I explained that I was caught off guard and just wanted to finish the conversation quickly. My wife responded that she understood I was flustered when talking to Jen. She mentioned that when Jen hugged me, everyone at the table started staring and one of my friends Rita made some scandalous remarks about Jen's interaction with me. My wife, who had never seen Jen before, took a moment to recognize her. 
She hoped I would introduce her to Jen so Jen would understand that she was my wife and not just a random woman. When I didn't, Jen noticed and gave my wife a dirty look. My wife hoped I would introduce her, but I hurried back to the table with her. I apologized again and admitted that, in hindsight, I should have handled it differently. I was simply trying to finish the conversation and wasn't thinking clearly. My wife asked why I seemed so strange around Jen. I wished I had a better explanation, but talking to Jen felt wrong, and my only thought was to return to my wife. She mentioned feeling insecure upon seeing how beautiful Jen was, and the comments from my friends didn't help. My wife was curious if I ever wished Jen hadn't broken up with me. I reassured her that if I had a time machine, I would wish 100 out of 100 times that Jen had left me, so I could meet my wife and build our beautiful life together. This made her smile and she gave me a big hug. I asked if I should message Jen to let her know I'm married. She said there was no need since my profile picture on messaging apps is with my wife and Jen should have seen that. Additionally, my Instagram is public with many pictures of us. She advised me to ignore Jen's message and move on with our lives. Thanks again to everyone for your honest feedback, just as I expected from Reddit. Welcome back to Daily Reddit Stories, let's start with the story. AITA for saying my kids are the main reason I would never cheat on my wife. I've been friends with Jason 38N since high school. Over the years, our families have grown close, and our kids are of similar ages. For context, Jason is married to Bree and they have two young girls. Last month, Bree received anonymous messages suggesting that Jason was cheating on her. When Bree started looking into it, she discovered that Jason had been having an affair with a co-worker for the past two years. This revelation was devastating for Bree, and she reached out to my wife for support. My wife and I decided to stand by Bree during this difficult time. We helped her confront Jason, and as a result, she asked him to leave their home. Jason has since moved in with his parents and has been trying everything he can to reconcile with Bree. Given the circumstances, I had to make a difficult decision to support Bree and her children while cutting off contact with Jason. Despite his attempts to reach out to me, I remain firm in my decision. Last week, Jason's mother contacted me to let me know that Jason was struggling. She told me he was experiencing severe panic attacks and wanted to talk. I was hesitant to agree, especially since my wife was strongly opposed to the idea. However, after some consideration I decided to meet with him. He came over to our house on Friday evening. My wife chose to stay in our bedroom with the kids because she didn't want to see him. When Jason arrived, he was extremely apologetic and emotional. He told me how angry he was at himself for his actions, how he had ended the affair in an attempt to repair his relationship with Bree, and how he was planning to leave his job to distance himself from the situation. He asked me to speak with Bree on his behalf so they could at least discuss their marriage and possibly find a way to move forward. It was heartbreaking to see him so distressed, but he began to shift some of the blame onto Bree. He complained that Bree had been ignoring him for years and that their problems had driven him to make this grave mistake. I lost my patience and told Jason to stop blaming Bree. I told him if he had issues with her, he should have addressed them directly instead of cheating. I made it clear that cheating was the worst thing he could have done and that he had no idea how deeply he had hurt Bree. I told him that his actions not only devastated Bree, but also negatively impacted his children's lives. They had done nothing wrong but were now suffering because of his selfish behavior. I explained that his actions had punished his kids and their lives would never be the same. I was angrier at him for ruining his daughter's lives than I was about the situation with Bree. We argued for some time and eventually I told him that I couldn't help him and that we would continue to support Bree and ensure she and the kids were taken care of. He left after that. My wife appreciated that I didn't support Jason and that I didn't let him shift the blame to Bree. However, before we went to bed, she asked why I focused so much on the impact on the kids when talking to Jason. She felt that Bree, as the one who was wrong, should have been the primary focus of my conversation with Jason. I told her that from my perspective, I felt more for the kids because they had a stable home that Jason had destroyed. 
My wife then asked if I would stop myself from cheating because of my love for her, or because of our kids, we also have two girls. I replied that while my morals would be the main reason, the thought of ruining our daughter's lives would also prevent me from ever cheating. My wife was hurt by my response because she felt she should be the main reason for my fidelity. I understand her perspective and love her deeply. However, I also want our daughters to have a stable and loving home, which is why I said what I did. Am I wrong for prioritizing my daughter's happiness over my love for my wife? Shouldn't she be the main reason for my commitment to our marriage? Loptate? I want to express my gratitude to everyone who offered advice on my previous post. The past week has been overwhelming and I've been left feeling numb after what happened yesterday. As you know, Jason was caught cheating last month, and during our heated argument last week, I told him he should have considered his kids before engaging in a two-year affair. My wife was upset that I focused on the kids rather than on Bree, who was the one wronged. I agree that my comments may have been harsh, and it was an emotionally charged situation. That night, I had a long and heartfelt conversation with my wife. I apologize for saying that the main reason I would avoid cheating was to protect our daughter's happiness and reassured her of my love and commitment. She was understanding and didn't hold it against me, but she did wonder why I kept emphasizing the kids during my conversation with Jason. The reason I focused on the kids was because, when Bree found out about the affair, she was devastated and reached out to my wife, who is one of her closest friends. I volunteered to look after Jason's daughters while Bree took time to recover. His older daughter, who is eight, somewhat grasped the situation, but his four-year-old daughter, who is very attached to her dad, kept asking for him. It was heart-wrenching to witness their suffering and to see how their lives were being upended by Jason's actions. I understand that this was their relationship, but the impact on the kids affected me deeply. My wife was supportive and later spoke with Bree about my conversation with Jason. Bree was hurt but asked if she could come over to discuss things with me. When Bree visited, she wanted to know about my conversation with Jason. I was honest about everything that happened and apologized for my comments. Bree asked if we thought Jason could change and if we could host both of them to ensure they felt safe. Jason and Bree came over on Sunday, and it was the first time Jason had seen his daughters in a month. It was a very emotional reunion, with tears all around. Jason apologized extensively to Bree, promising to do everything he could to make things right. He had given a 14-day notice at his job, vowed never to see his affair partner again, and suggested moving closer to Bree's parents for a fresh start. Bree accepted most of his promises, but decided against moving. They agreed that Jason could return home, and they would work on their relationship from there. They thanked us for our help, and Jason also apologized to me for the drama. While it seemed like a positive outcome on the surface, my wife is concerned that my comments about the kids might have pressured Bree into taking Jason back. I never intended to interfere in the relationship, and I hope they find a way to heal and move forward. I'm seeking opinions on whether what I did was right, or if I accidentally played a role in getting them back together, possibly leading to more issues if Jason cheats again in the future. Honestly, this is exactly why I'm feeling so bad. I didn't mean to but my comments might have made Bree feel guilty and stay with Jason. I've known Jason for a lifetime and never thought he was capable of betraying Bree. I no longer trust him and am unsure if I can continue being friends with him. The problem is, I really don't want to be involved in their issues anymore. I feel like Jason is my friend but it's strange to give them advice about their own marriage. I don't feel like it's my place to tell them what to do. I know Jason is a terrible person for what he did, but I hope he will change and not hurt Bree any further. I always worry that Bree might end up in a worse situation because of something I said in the heat of the moment. Thank you everyone for listening to my story. AITA for breaking up with my girlfriend after she got a dog. I'm a 25-year-old man and my girlfriend is a 23-year-old woman. We've been together for over a year and have generally enjoyed a fantastic relationship. She's humorous and kind and things have been great between us until yesterday. 
When I arrived home yesterday, I was surprised to find a golden retriever in our house. I asked my girlfriend whose dog it was, and she responded with a smile saying, ours. Initially, I wasn't sure if she was joking or serious, so I kept pressing her about the dog's owner. She continued smiling and repeating, ours, and then mentioned the dog's name, though I don't remember it clearly because my mind was racing. She even instructed the dog to say, hi, dad. I told her she couldn't be serious, and she responded with a cheerful, why? I didn't say anything further and decided to leave the house and head to a hotel. Early in our relationship I had made it clear that I don't like dogs and can't be in the same room with one. Whenever I encounter a dog in public, I always keep a safe distance from the person walking it. I told her that if she wanted a pet, it would have to be a cat or something other than a dog. While I was at the hotel, my girlfriend called me several times, but I didn't answer. Then she sent me a text saying that I was overreacting and that my fear of dogs was unreasonable. She suggested that I should at least try living with a dog for a while and that she and the dog would help me overcome my fear. But I had never asked to overcome it, and honestly it didn't bother me as long as no dogs were in my house. I had never been bothered by dogs in public because I always maintained my distance. I have never petted a dog before and have no intention of ever doing so. I ignored her messages and went to sleep, intending to make a decision when I was clear-headed. I didn't want to be the guy who demands it's either me or the dog. She clearly loves dogs and I don't, so I was considering breaking up with her, despite the fact that she had been amazing throughout the past year. Update After reading numerous comments from both perspectives, some saying I'm not the asshole and others saying I am, I decided to meet with my girlfriend and discuss the situation further. I told her that her actions were wrong, but she maintained that I was overreacting and wasn't ready to apologize. After more discussion I told her that I wanted to break up. Initially she didn't believe me and thought I was trying to hurt her or seek revenge. Then she started crying and eventually she got angry and tried to hit me I held her until she calmed down. We talked again after some time and she asked, what am I supposed to do? She mentioned that she couldn't take care of the dog on her own, so I offered to help her find a new home for the dog. I also suggested that if she didn't want to move out, she could stay at my place while I found a new place for myself. Additionally, I told her that I would cover her rent for this mom. I know I didn't have to do any of this, but I couldn't just leave her in a tough spot and didn't want to see her suffer. She thanked me for the offer and said she would think about it. I could tell she was still in shock, so I decided to give her some space. For the past couple of days, I've been staying with a friend who helped me move some of my belongings while my ex decides if she wants to stay or find a new place. I decided to give her a couple of days to make up her mind. The day after our breakup, my friend and I tried to find a new home for the dog since she couldn't care for it. She told me she took the dog to one of her friend's houses, but her friend couldn't assist with finding a permanent home. Honestly, none of this has been good for my mental well-being, so I've taken a week off work to sort everything out. I can't leave the dog on the street, and I'm pretty sure it's illegal to do that in the UK. Anyway, we had no luck and couldn't find a home for the dog so we'll try again tomorrow. After my friend and I returned to his place, my ex called me. She called to ask for another chance and apologized. I told her I had already forgiven her, but we're just not compatible, and I told her, you're young and beautiful, you'll find someone else. But she became even more upset. That's essentially where things stand for now. I didn't expect my original post to go viral. I anticipate it may be 30 comments, and hope for a manageable amount of feedback. Because of this, I didn't provide many details in the initial post, thinking I could address questions as they came up. So, this time, I'm providing as many details as I'm comfortable with. Additional Clarification I want to clarify a few things as I can't respond to all the comments, there were over a thousand. Was it a puppy or a dog? No, it wasn't a puppy, it was a fully grown dog. Why did you leave without talking to her? I left to avoid saying anything out of anger and needed to clear my head before addressing the situation. That's also why I didn't answer her calls or messages. Her messages only made me angrier, as I didn't want or need any help. Is it your house or her house? I pay the rent for the house. She moved in with me after we discussed and decided to live together. Since my place was closer to both of our workplaces and larger, we chose to move here. She was struggling financially, 
and although she wanted to contribute half the rent, I didn't let her pay until she was in a better financial position. Why did you post on Reddit? I made this post because I was unsure what to do after waking up. The reasons I wanted to break up are as follows. I felt disrespected that she made such a significant decision about our living situation without informing me beforehand. This isn't just about the dog. I believe that major decisions in a relationship should be made together. Her lack of consideration for this is a significant issue for me. I felt betrayed that she would use my phobia against me and dismiss it as ridiculous, especially since it's not something I can control or choose to have. I also didn't want her to be without a dog if she genuinely wanted one. I had noticed her looking at dog reels on Instagram frequently, but never thought she wanted a dog since she never mentioned it. When we started our relationship, I made it clear that I couldn't be around dogs because it could be a deal breaker for some. She still said it didn't bother her, which now frustrates me. Final update Yesterday, before making this post, I asked for a raise at work, but they responded that they couldn't afford it. So today I went to work and resigned. I'm about to meet the person who wants to take the dog. If we can confirm that he's capable of caring for her, we'll let him take the dog. Additionally, my ex will keep the apartment, and I will work on getting my name removed from the lease, which should take a day or two. There will be no further updates after this, because I don't see why anyone would be interested in what happens next. However, I will update on the dog situation later today after I return home, and I will try to answer questions in my free time. One last note. I know many of you believe I shouldn't have helped my ex like this, but I didn't do it just for her. I did it for myself and to ensure that an innocent dog doesn't suffer due to her actions. I made this decision because she has no family or close friends in the UK. Imagine if I had kicked her out with the responsibility of the dog and she had no place to stay or any decent friend to turn to, with no family to support her. Such situations can lead someone to contemplate drastic actions, like suicide. I'm not saying she would definitely do this, but there's a significant chance she might, and it's better to be safe than sorry. So, I did what I did for myself because I don't want to look back with regret. I want to see this as a time when I grew as a person. So I guess I was being somewhat selfish. Thanks to everyone, and peace out. AITA for defining to fabricate my job to win over my girlfriend's parents. I, 28M, have been in a relationship with my girlfriend, Sarah, 26F, for about a year, and things have been going really well. Recently, however, Sarah asked me to do something that made me quite uncomfortable. We're planning to meet her parents for the first time next week, and she requested that I lie about my profession. I'm a graphic designer, and I genuinely enjoy my work. It's a fulfilling job that allows me to be creative and engage in a range of interesting projects. However, Sarah believes her parents will look down on my career because it's not as high-paying or prestigious as other professions. Sarah comes from a family of high achievers, her father is a lawyer, and her mother is a doctor. She's concerned that they won't take me seriously or approve of our relationship if they find out what I actually do. Therefore, she asked me to tell them that I'm a lawyer. She even coached me on some legal terminology and provided me with a fabricated backstory to support the lie. I refused because I didn't want to start a relationship with her parents based on deception. I told her that if they can't accept me for who I am, it's better they learn the truth now rather than later. Sarah was very upset and accused me of being obstinate and unreasonable. She believes I'm making a bigger deal out of this than necessary, and that I don't understand how crucial her parents' approval is to her. Since our argument, she's been distant and cold which makes me wonder if I'm at fault here. On one hand, I understand she wants her parents to like me and support our relationship. On the other hand, asking me to lie about something as fundamental as my job feels like crossing a boundary. It's not just a minor fib, it's a crucial part of who I am and what I do. She's still my girlfriend, and I still love her, but now I'm starting to wonder if she truly loves me back. This whole situation is making me feel really confused. Before I only worried about the lying aspect. Now, after seeing many people say things like she doesn't respect me, is embarrassed and ashamed of me, is manipulative, deceitful, and a fraud, it feels like there's more going on than I initially thought. I plan to have a talk with her this evening. I'm unsure how to approach it since she's already on edge, hurt and distant. Despite all this, I still love her and unlike what others are suggesting, I'm not ready to end our relationship without trying to resolve this first. 
we've had a good year together, and I owe it to both of us to at least try to work things out. For those wondering why I haven't met her parents yet, it's because Sarah is in low contact with her family, and they're not very close. They don't even know where she lives, just the city and state. As for her job, she works in marketing and makes half of what I make. Ironically, her parents don't have a problem with that as they are more traditional and believe it's a man's duty to provide for the family. Sarah doesn't share these views and her limited contact with her family is one reason she believes they won't find out the truth and that I should just lie. Update So I finally confronted Sarah about everything, and it did not go well. I told her I felt she was embarrassed by me and ashamed of my job. She went ballistic, asking me who was feeding me this nonsense. I couldn't tell her about posting on Reddit, so I said a friend made me realize it. She got even angrier, accusing me of betraying her trust by sharing personal information with friends. I can only imagine how she'll react when she finds out 312 people have seen it on Reddit. She insisted I was being unreasonable, and that if I wanted to meet her parents, I had to go along with her story. I refused, saying I wouldn't lie to them and was fine with not meeting them at all. I told her she didn't respect me or my job and was ashamed of me I even said that if she wanted to be this way, maybe I didn't want to be with her anymore. She started crying, calling me selfish, and saying I didn't understand anything. Then she revealed a major issue. She explained that the reason she has minimal contact with her parents is that they are extremely controlling and manipulative. They had impossibly high expectations and threatened to cut off her college funding if she didn't comply with their demands. After she graduated and moved away, they were enraged and cut her off, taking her trust fund. She's an only child, and her only chance of getting back in their good graces and regaining her inheritance is to win their approval. She told me her parents would rather keep their money than give it to her if she didn't earn their approval. Sarah also admitted she planned to lie about both her job and my background. She said her parents would see me as a gold digger if they knew I wasn't wealthy and would never provide her with any money. She intended to fabricate a story about me coming from an old money family that they couldn't trace. Lying about my job wasn't enough, she said she needed to lie about my background too because being from an old money family was just as important. She hadn't told me this sooner because she feared I'd break up with her over it and hoped to persuade me without revealing everything. At this point I didn't know what to say. After reading all the comments on Reddit, I wasn't sure if what she was saying was true. I told her I didn't care about the inheritance. If she and her parents can't accept me for who I am, then maybe this relationship isn't right for me. She started crying again, calling me a selfish bastard and saying she did all this for me and our future together. She envisioned a happy family, a home, children, and everything. I was deeply shaken, angry, and hurt, so I packed a few clothes and moved out to stay with a friend. Now, I'm unsure about what to do next. Featured Comments in this morning star, NTA it's real fucking rich that she's repeatedly calling you selfish when she's the one that wants you to lie and make up this elaborate story about your family history just so she can get her trust fund back. Maybe her parents are controlling, maybe it's more lies. Hard to know from someone so willing to say whatever it takes to get what she wants. Also claiming she's only doing this for your future is ridiculous. You both have good careers, you can have a family with a nice home, and all the extra things in life without groveling for her parents. Especially because this will only be the beginning. If they truly are controlling like she says then she's planning to exchange control over your lives for more money. You don't think they'll want to say in things like where you buy a house? You already said they were upset she moved away. You don't think they'll demand a say in how your children are raised? And she'll bow to them on everything and insult you and say you're selfish if you don't do what they say because money is what is important to her. Just think long and hard about whether or not this is the future you truly want. Money is nice but is it worth letting other people control your life and having to lie about who you are to make other people happy? Kowet Kowet All this plus her lies about op e lawyer coming from an old wealthy family when father is a lawyer himself, would be so easy to identify that he would be taken for a gold digger by the parents without any doubt. The strategy is totally stupid and Op would never be able to trust her now. She is beyond stupid if any of this is true. Independent, yes, she said it's not just about the trust fund, but her parents' entire estate and inheritance. She is the heiress to that, but she said her parents are full of ego, pride etc., and I quote, when they die, they'll take the money to their grave rather than giving it to me, their only fucking child. She's been bombarding me with messages that we could use this money and that she'll get most of it when we get married because her parents agreed to give some of the money if she marries someone they approve of. 
She's even created some sort of fake documents for me and has been sending me pictures where everything but my picture is real. She's texting me that if the reason why I don't want to do this is because we might get caught, these documents will make sure we won't. I don't know what exactly these documents are, so if someone can recognize such documents, leave a comment and I'll DM you after blurring my face. According to her, she texted, see after this, they can never suspect us in a million years, and we will seem legit. I'm sort of leaving her on read because I don't want to ask her what exactly these documents are right now. But now I am sure I'll have to break up with her, because it seems like she has been planning this for months. She's really gone off the deep end. A-I-T-A, H for destroying my cousin's marriage. My family is a little unusual. There are three adults and two children. The adults are me, my wife, and another woman best described as my wife's platonic life partner, and also my very dear friend. I'll call my partner Sally. Sally has lived with us for 20 years. The kids call her Ma. We live in a four-bedroom house, and Sally and the kids each have their own bedrooms. Sally is aromantic and asexual. She and my wife love each other very much, but platonically. Sally is like a sister to me, I cannot overstate how incredibly platonic her relationships with both of us have always been. We're all very happy together. I've been super glad we have her since we had the kids parenting is so much easier when you have a numbers advantage. My cousin Dave has been married to his wife Mary for something like 15 years. They have two kids. Dave talked Mary into opening the relationship about a year ago and now they're getting divorced because he's struggling to find anyone willing to date him. Mary isn't and he's incredibly pissy about it and it's destroying their relationship. And by it's, I kinda mean he's. He's jealous and resentful and making that her problem. And also, now mine, because he says it's my fault. According to him, he thought it would totally work great because my family, make polygamy and open relationships look easy. Which? What? Setting aside that Sally's relationships with both my wife and me are platonic, there's no open relationship in our household. Sally and I each get a weekly date night with my wife. I take the kids on her night and she takes them on mine. I did say parenting is easier with the numbers advantage. I think my wife and I would have significantly more quality time together than we would have if it had just been the two of us. When the kids can't sleep, they go to Sally, so my wife and I are never disturbed after we go to bed. Sometimes Sally and I go to games together, and my wife takes the kids then because she's not into sports. No one is dating anyone from outside our house. These are committed relationships that are, to all intents and purposes, exclusive. None of us has ever mentioned seeing anyone else. Even if we were witch again, we're not I don't see how that would make me responsible for him treating Mary terribly because he's jealous. Somehow, he was apparently convinced that he and his beer gut would get all the girls, but no man would be interested in a charming kind woman who keeps herself in reasonable shape and bakes the best cupcakes you will ever taste. I'd have dismissed this out of hand, but my aunt, his mother, and like six other family members agree that I'm the ah and have been insisting I should apologize to my idiot cousin and help him talk Mary into closing the relationship and staying with him. I like Mary. We've been friends for 20 years and she's a good person. Also friends with my wife and Sally a W, a wonderful aunt to my kids. Given the choice between her and Dave, I keep Mary and her kids in the family. Someone in my family is insane here. Is it me or them? Who's the ah? TL, TR, my cousin Dave persuaded his wife Mary to open their relationship, and now he's pissed she's dating, and he isn't. He was blaming me because he claims my extremely closed relationship situation made open relationships look easy, just because there's a third adult in my family, a bunch of other people, were hassling me to take the blame. So far, so stupid, right? Turns out that, unbeknownst to me, Dave's sister, Tina, reads this sub. A lot. She saw my post and immediately figured out that it was me posting about her brother. She won't tell me if she was one of the commenters or not, but for those of you who called Dave the golden child, Tina says you were right on the money. She called me this morning. And like she seemed to find that really validating, and I have literally never heard her sound so happy. She's usually pretty depressed, so thanks, everyone who decided to read into their family dynamics, you did her a solid. That was about 8am. I had to get off the phone to head to work, and then at about 10 I got a text from my wife that just said come home now. I got another one just as I was starting the car that said the kids are fine which I really appreciate because that at least let me change gears from panic to concern. At some point, we might discuss that. 
it would be good to include that in the first text. Anyway, that is not the point. I got home as fast as I safely could. I pulled up on the verge and tried to go in the front door, but the handle was handles broken. Mary's car was parked in the driveway. I had to go in through the garage. Inside there was my wife, Mary and Mary's eldest, Jack M12. Mary was banging around the kitchen, and Jack was crying on my wife. As I understand it, what happened was. Just before she called me, Tina texted her brother a link to the post and made some kind of comment about it. I don't know what exactly she said, but Dave went into a rage. Like the kind I thought he grew out of when we were teenagers, breaking shit and screaming. I thought the last time he did it was the time he hit my little brother, and I beat the shit out of him. I'm not saying it was right, but we were kids, I'm also not saying I'm sorry, to be honest. And then he hit Mary. She's got a bruise coming up on her face. Fuck, I'm shaking writing this. I feel like it's my fault. I can't remember if we told her that he used to be like that. We honestly thought he'd grown out of it. Mary managed to get the kids in the car and drove straight to our place because she knew there'd be someone home. Sal is a stay-at-home mother, and my wife works from home some days, and there's just generally someone home. Dave followed and tried to force his way in. Apparently, my expensive security door was worth the money because he managed to damage the handle, but the door stayed closed. Seems he gave up and ran when my wife yelled that I was on my way home. Jack burst into tears while he and I were moving furniture, so we talked and hugged for a bit, and now he's having a lie down in my bed because he was kinda run out. We're waiting for a locksmith to fix the door as well. After that, we're going to take him and Mary to the police station to make a report, give statements, and do whatever's involved in all that. Sally took our kids and Mary's youngest to my parents' place in case Dave came back, they're too young for this shit, but Jack refused to leave his mother. We're going to meet up with them after the police station. Those of you who said we should adopt Mary are getting their wish, at least for now. Jack's going to be sleeping in my youngest's big boy bed. The kidlet gets to stay in his cot and sleep in Sally's room for a bit, and Mary's youngest and my eldest will be sharing a room because they're only a few months apart, and they get on well. Mary's sleeping on our couch until we get all this figured out. My youngest will probably think this is the best day ever. He hates his big boy bad, and he's going to get a reprieve from the transition, plus, he gets to share a room with his ma, and there are cupcakes in the house because Mary stress bakes, and our kitchen counter is covered in cupcakes. I should add that according to Tina, Dave was telling his family that I talked him into the open marriage thing specifically because I wanted to sleep with Mary. Plus a bunch of other shit that I've honestly forgotten, it's been an absolute shit of a day, and it's only half past two. I'm pretty sure I just acquired a 12-year-old son 10 years early and seriously messed up, at least for a while, and I have to figure out how I'm going to fit Jack's needs into my life without neglecting my own kids. I can't even tell if I'm exaggerating. Jack's a wreck and maybe those please be my dad now vibes are temporary, but maybe they're not you know? Gonna end this now before I start rambling. Or keep rambling, I don't even know. Thanks everyone for all of your input. Don't be mad at Tina. I don't think there's any way she could have predicted Dave would lose his mind. First of all, update on events for the people who were concerned. Mary and the kids will not be staying with us, as charming an idea as that is. This weekend, her brother will be coming to pick them up, and they'll be going to live with Mary's parents for now. They live about six hours out of town, so it's not an easy drop-off. We're looking for a counselor for Jack, who does telehealth because there aren't really any in her parents' small town. I don't know what's happening with the legal stuff. It's only been a couple of days, I'm not sure anyone entirely knows. I got a few general themes in the comments slash DMs, so I'm going to make some collective replies. Those of you who were worried about Mary and the kids, thank you. Hopefully, they'll be okay. Her family is rallying around, and my wife and I are all taking her side. Those of you who thought this was all fake, okay? Not sure what you want me to do with that. The person who kept spamming me with, Hi Liz, how did you not realize you had the wrong username for over 24 hours? What the hell? Those of you who thought the story was unrealistic, because I was too heroic throughout Hot Damn, thank you for noticing what a goddamn hero I am. What was your favorite part of all my heroics? The part where I was a shithead teenager with anger issues, the part where I got a text message and came home after all the drama was over. Or the part where a traumatized child burst into tears and I panicked so badly I thought it meant I had to be his dad now. When they make the movie, I want Hugh Jackman to play me. The people posting their harem slash sister wives fantasy shit. You're as bad as Dave, 
but I'll allow that you spell better. If you can't even imagine the possibility that a man could have friends who are women, he doesn't fuck you is your problem. If you can't imagine that, even when one of the women involved is aromantic and asexual, you might be a problem. The people who were concerned I was endangering Mary and the kids by putting it in a post that Dave might see that they were in my house where he already knew they were, since he already knew, I don't think so. Thank you to all the people who have been kind and sympathetic. You don't deserve all the sarcasm in this post and it's not directed at you. You're all lovely. I'm just tired. A ITA for meeting my father after he stole my brother's wife. I, 27 am, have two siblings, my sister Cass, 30 and my brother Mark, 30 Tuam. Our parents divorced when I was 10, and we split our time between them. Cass was always closer to our dad, and she has always disliked Mark, making claims about him that are hard to believe. Despite this, she has always loved me. Five years ago, we found out that Mark's wife Jane was cheating on him with our father. This caused chaos in our family. Cass sided with our dad, Mark moved in with our mom and I sided with him. Even though I sided with Mark, I've always kept in contact with Cass, and Mark is okay with that. I didn't see my dad again until this Friday, when he and Jane dropped Cass off at our mom's for Mother's Day. I was outside walking home, and my dad noticed me. For some reason I agreed to have coffee with them. It was a tense conversation, and I confirmed that he wouldn't be invited to my wedding, and that I didn't know if I wanted to get to know his and Jane's kids. He even told me, I did the right thing choosing Mark. It was weird, but he dropped me off after about half an hour. Mark saw him from the window and has been cold and snippy with me since then. Mark had a meltdown, ranting at mom for not caring more about what our dad did to his life, than at Cass for always halfway associating with him just for mom's sake. Then he kicked me in the stomach, and I literally fell through a table like it was WWE. Cass said his behavior is why Jane left him and called the cops on him. I feel the worst for our mom because she just wanted a good Mother's Day, and our issues ruined her weekend. I went to the hospital because Cass begged me to. I'm perfectly fine, there's nothing wrong with me, I didn't press charges on Mark because I feel bad for him. Life has dealt him a pretty garbage hand, and there's no point in making things worse. Mark moved out, and I don't know where he is now. He only talked to our mom before he left, and she hasn't told me what it was about. Mom Cass and I had a big conversation and Cass admitted that she doesn't love or like Mark. She brought up incidents from when they were teenagers and said she doesn't trust him. She admitted she only associated with him for mom's sake, and is glad that Jane is with our dad. That was rough to hear, and it made our mom cry a lot. Cass made it clear she won't stop seeing our dad and Jane. She wants me to get to know our little siblings but won't force me and will understand if I never do. I felt like I had to post this because I needed to vent. I wish there was a resolution to all this, that we could be a family again. But I'm angry and frustrated that there is none, and it seems like there never will be. Update? Mark has pretty much gone off the deep end. Last week, he messaged our mom to clear out his room because he's not coming back and to throw everything away. While doing this, Cass found a USB in his closet. It had a bunch of photos of her on it. Nothing inappropriate but it made Cass break down and she spent time in the hospital psych ward. She got out a few days ago. I talked to her but haven't seen her because our dad picked her up and she stayed with him. On Sunday, she posted on Instagram, praising our dad and Jane, mocking Mark and saying awful things about him. That somehow reached Mark and he came crashing home, drunk, driving his Prius into my truck. Thankfully, I was with my fiancé's family. According to mom, he demanded to see me to kick my ass, blaming me for everything. I kind of do too. Everything was mostly fine until I got in that car with my dad. Now, everyone's spiraling, even me a little bit. I mostly just feel bad for our mom, because this has her feeling so down and awful. Update 2 My account was deleted again. I don't know why. This might be my last update, but I'm venting. About three weeks ago, Mark was arrested for assaulting Cass. He went to her place, saying he wanted to apologize and talk about the pictures, and then he assaulted her. He called the cops on himself. I don't know why she let him in without someone else there. 
when the cops came, he was drunk and forcing her to spoon with him on the floor, ranting that they belonged together. She wasn't moving or talking until our dad came, and then she got back to normal. Just the thought makes me want to throw up and punch something. Cass was in the hospital for a week. She didn't want to stay longer and screamed until they let me take her. She stayed with our dad, acting like a little girl around him, calling him Dada and Daddy. She visits me and my fiancé almost every day. She knows how upset I am and tells me it's not my job to protect her, that she's my older sister and it's her job to protect me. She says I did nothing wrong and that by being there for her now, I'm doing all I can. I feel like she should hate me because maybe if I'd asked her to stay with me after Mark drove drunk or hit me, things would have been different. But whenever she sees me, she's looking out for me. I've offered to let her stay with me and my fiancé, but she wants to stay with our dad because she feels he can protect her. I didn't, and I'm why this even happened. I don't really feel bad for my mom anymore. She's visited Mark a lot, and feels like there must be a way he's innocent. Cass told me to give mom time and think about how hard it must be for her, but I feel ashamed she said that. I know mom just doesn't want to believe Mark did what he did, but he did. People have been asking how Cass saved my life and my fiancé's. For me, she donated bone marrow. For my fiancé, she tackled her out of the way of a speeding car. And this is the person I couldn't protect. I guess everyone who called me spineless, and an enabler was right. WAP Day 3 A few days after the last update, Cass visited me again. This time she seemed even more fragile than before. She looked at me with those big, sad eyes, and told me that she was struggling to understand why everything had to be so hard. She asked if she was a bad person for siding with our dad, for loving him despite everything. I didn't know what to say. I told her that love is complicated, and that none of this was her fault. She stayed with us that night, not wanting to go back to our dad's place. It was the first time in a long while that we had a peaceful night together, just watching TV and reminiscing about the good old days. It felt like a small glimmer of hope amidst all the chaos. The next morning, Cass received a call from our dad. I could see the tension in her face as she spoke to him. She told him she needed some space and that she was staying with me for a while. He didn't take it well, but she stood her ground. I was proud of her for that. That afternoon, we received a call from the police. Mark had been found. He was in a bad state, drunk and disoriented. They had taken him to the hospital, and he was asking for our mom. When she arrived, he broke down, confessing that he didn't know how to fix anything, that he felt like he had lost everything. It was heartbreaking to hear. Mom called us from the hospital, her voice trembling as she recounted Mark's words. Cass and I rushed over, wanting to be there for our brother despite everything. When we arrived, Mark looked up at us with tears in his eyes. For a moment, it felt like we were a family again united in our pain and confusion. Mark was admitted to a rehab center shortly after that. It was a tough decision, but we all knew it was necessary. Cass and I visited him regularly, slowly trying to rebuild our relationship with him. It wasn't easy, but we were making progress. Throughout all of this our dad tried to reach out, but Cass was firm in keeping her distance. She needed time to heal, to understand her own feelings without his influence. I supported her decision, knowing that it was what she needed. Months passed, and slowly, things began to improve. Cass found a therapist who helped her work through her issues, and Mark started to make strides in his recovery. Our mom, though still struggling, was finding solace in seeing her children slowly coming back together. One day, Cass and I were sitting in the park, talking about everything that had happened. She looked at me and said, Maybe we can't change the past but we can try to build a better future. I nodded, knowing she was right. It's been a long, difficult journey, but we're still here, still fighting to find our way back to each other. There's no easy fix, no magic solution, but there's hope. And sometimes, that's enough.